Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club, and we have a special guest joining us this morning. We have Dr. Yes, Joy indeed. Harden Bradford. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Joy. First of all, I got to say I love your podcast, Therapy for Black Girls. Thank you. So, so salute to you on that. And why why did you decide the the, the target Black women in particular for, for your mental health platform? Yeah, so I have a background in college student mental health. And so every campus that I've been on, I always ran a support group for the Black women on campus because I noticed that they were not coming to the counseling center at the same rate as their peers. And so it felt really important to be able to go to them where they were um, and to provide support and let them know that the counseling center exists and the kinds of things that you could talk about with a therapist. So break down the podcast a little bit, because I mean, you guys do numerous episodes. So how do you break it down as far as what you discuss, what you talk about, what people are dealing with? How do you break it down? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I really, I really feel like I'm very tapped into the community surrounding our podcast, like really everything comes from the community. And so Mm -hmm. we are in continuous conversation with them about what kinds of things they want to talk about. Um, I am also a huge pop culture fan. And so I'm paying attention and also watching and listening to the things that the community is watching and listening to. And so at any opportunity I have to bring some of that into the podcast, I take that opportunity. Um, So we will have have some podcast episodes that we call on the couch episodes, um, which is where we will take a fictional black character like Olivia Pope or Mary Jane Paul from Being Mary Jane. And mm-hmm. uh, I, either I will do that episode alone or with a, a fellow therapist. And we will talk about what kinds of things might these people talk about if they came to therapy. Um, and so I really feel like that has helped to bring therapy to life for a lot of people, especially if they've not had therapy before, um, because then you get a little glimpse of what might happen if you actually talk to a therapist. Gotcha. Mm. Now, Dr. Joy, you've had the platform Therapy for Black Girls for a while now. How have things changed because of coronavirus? Have there been more people that have been reaching out and logging on? Have you seen uh, different types of issues that people want to bring up with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that the need was there even before the pandemic, right? Um, but definitely we've seen an increase just in numbers of people to our community, um, as well as an increase in number of people using our therapist directory to reach out for support. Um, and so some of the conversations that it feels like have arisen are really related to anxiety. So people are really anxious. At first it was around how do I keep myself safe? How do I keep my family safe? Um, then concerns around employment, what's going to happen? Am I going to stay? still have her job. Um, And then, of course, as we saw the increase in racial tensions, then there was lots of stress related to, you know, the fact that we're just trying to get through a pandemic and we still have to deal with racism. So there definitely has been an increase in usage of the platform. How do you you think the injustices of uh, Breonna Taylor's murder case or even seeing the the, the George Floyd situation, how how do you think that affected, you know, Black people mentally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, there's lots and lots of research that talks about the impact that racism has on our mental health. And so I think we are just continuing to experience that. And it, it often feels like we can't get a breath from the last injustice before the next one happens, right? And so I think particularly for Black women, um, we have really been struggling with Breonna Taylor's death because even though we know that the system is unlikely to find justice for us, there's something particularly heinous about being killed in your own home unaware while you're sleeping that anything's even happening and you know the fact that the officers have not even been brought to trial um so i think for black women it makes us continue to feel invisible as if nobody's protecting us as if any nobody's really paying attention to our needs and our concerns i was gonna say do you think Uh, everybody needs to see a therapist or or speak with somebody um because i know a lot of people are against it no i don't need to speak to somebody but then when they finally do talk to somebody they feel like well i I, wow i really needed that do you think that's something that everybody should absolutely positively be able to talk to somebody i think that everybody who wants it 
absolutely should have access to it, but I do think we have to pay attention to some of the barriers that do still exist in talking with a therapist, um, so everybody can't afford it. Um, and like you said, everybody is not really interested, but I do think it's important to focus on the fact that there are lots of different ways that you could work with a therapist and get support. So you're right, Envy, a lot of people will be uh, against it initially and then realize, wow, I really appreciate having this non-judgmental person. I appreciate having this 45 to 50 minute of space just dedicated to me every week. So a lot of people do change their minds after they've um, initiated the process. You have to tell I the truth. I just want to go back to what you were saying about Breonna Taylor, because we had a whole topic on The Breakfast Club where we let Black women call in and just express how they were feeling when the officers were not charged in connection to her killing. And I was thinking about my social media and how a lot of, um, there were Black men that were very upset about that. Right, we were talking about how black women are so unprotected and they were saying, oh, this is divisive and you're trying to separate black men and black women. And I'm like, no, we're not trying to separate black women from black men. We're just trying to say we need some extra support at times like mm -hmm. this, because I feel like we are on the front lines of so many different things that are happening that affects all the communities. And sometimes people do need to show up for black women also. And it's not trying to divide the different men and women. It's just saying, hey, brothers, come and help your sisters out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that people really have to take a step back when they get into that kind of rhetoric and thinking, just because I asked for support for myself, I'm excluding support for you, you know, so I think you really have to check in with yourself to reflect on and examine what makes you hear that I am excluded from this because I am asking for support. You know, so I think that really triggers a lot of people and makes them feel, um, and we know as Black people as a whole, we have lots and lots of different barriers and stressors and lots of things that impact our community, but we can't deny that there are particular things that impact Black women that don't get the same level of attention as it would if something were to happen to a Black man. You know, Dr. Joy, when you was talking about going to therapy, um, you know, I, I always tell people if you're going to sit down with a therapist, you have to tell the truth. You can't go to a therapist and bullshit her or bullshit him. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's willing to tell the truth about yourself. You're, it's pointless to go. But that's the hard when, when the first time you go, because here you're meeting somebody that you don't really know. And everybody's always like, should I give them everything? Or maybe I give them a little bit now. And the next time I come back, I tell them the whole truth because you really don't know who you're sitting down with. Like you're talking to a stranger and you're giving up everything so you got to be able to to conquer that first and sometimes you're not honest with yourself too by the way right right you all make such incredibly good points you know and i think envy it is really important to treat therapy um like any other relationship in your life you know so if you would not talk to another stranger and give them completely everything on the first meeting it's okay to pace yourself with a therapist as well so you don't have to but feel you like with okay, a doctor though right with a <laughs> doctor you tell well, the doctor everything you know no, they don't people do not tell the doctor everything you better you better that, that's what that's I, just, well, I was just having a conversation yesterday about somebody who lies to their doctor that's ridiculous that's who is this person yeah, it is it is but when, I, when you're going to a primary care doctor or a doctor for a physical health concern you're thinking okay i only have this one time to go so i need to tell them everything whereas with a therapist i think most people assume that you're going to have more than one meeting so it's okay you know definitely tell as much as you feel comfortable with on that first meeting. And as you continue meeting with the therapist, if you feel like it's a good fit and there's trust building in the relationship, it's likely that you will feel more comfortable to share things that you hadn't shared previously. What are the most common misconceptions about therapy? Ooh, that's a great one. So I think one of the, the largest misconceptions about therapy is that you only go in a crisis, right? So the house kind of has to be on fire before you even reach out for help. When the truth is that um, if you talk with a therapist before we are at a code red, you could likely prevent a crisis because you could get some additional support. You might be able to get some additional perspective that you didn't have. And you might be able to learn some strategies that could prevent the situation from actually escalating. Mm. Um, I was going to say another huge misconception is that therapy is the same as talking to a friend. Um, you know, so a lot of people will say, well, why do I need to go pay somebody to talk to a therapist? I could just talk to my best friend. And the truth is that those things are not mutually exclusive. However, your best friend, even if they are a therapist, is not going to be your therapist. And so there are some similarities in terms of trust building, in terms of um, the safety that's created in the therapeutic relationship. But one of the huge differences with your therapist is that your therapist is 
not going to be sharing a whole bunch about themselves, or at least they shouldn't, right? So there may be some things they share just in terms of, you know, making the, the situation comfortable for you, but we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time with me telling you what happened on the weekend. The time is really dedicated to you and the concerns that you're bringing into therapy. How can somebody find a, a therapist? Like for somebody out there that's not sure, you know, what are, how do you look for one? Cause you know, Charlemagne talked about his therapist, his therapist before, you know, do you look like somebody, do you look at somebody and say, Hey, I want a black therapist because they might know more about me or understand me better. Or do you say, you know what? I don't want a black therapist. I want somebody that doesn't know me. Like, how do you go when you pick a therapist? Mm -hmm. So there really is no right or wrong answer. It's going to be the uh, therapist that is going to be the best fit for you. So people look for all kinds of different things. And I think that that's okay. So again, we have to acknowledge that this is a stranger that you're going to be likely talking about some deeply personal information about. And so you do want to pick the person that you will feel most comfortable talking to. Um, so we have a therapist directory, like I mentioned, on our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. And it is primarily full of other Black women therapists because I noticed a lot of Black women saying they wanted to talk with other Black women therapists. Um, so you can definitely use our website. Um, you can use other directories, Melanin Mental Health, um, Therapy for Black Men. There are lots of directories that are dedicated specifically to people of color who primarily are interested in talking with somebody else who looks like them. Um, but I think even beyond that, you do want to make sure that your therapist has the specialization in the thing that you're coming for, right? So if you are struggling with with, um, an eating disorder, let's say, you want to make sure that you find a therapist who's actually been trained in eating disorders. Otherwise, you may enjoy talking with them, but you may not get the same benefit as you would um, in talking with someone who actually has that specialty training. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm ready for a Black uh, therapist because, you know, uh, I need somebody that's a little more culturally competent, you know, because when mm -hmm. I first was seeking a therapist, I actually wanted somebody who was like, not in my world at all. I was actually looking for an Asian woman. Mm. And if you think trying to find a, a black woman is hard, Lord have mercy, try to find an Asian mm. woman. And so it's like, I wanted to talk to somebody who didn't necessarily have any of my biases per se, you know, somebody who could just give me an opinion from, from, a, from a whole other world. But I, I'm ready to talk mm. to somebody more culturally competent. Now, though. Mm hmm yeah, and I think a lot of people feel that way. You know, a lot of people um, will seek someone who looks like them because they want that sameness, especially right now, kind of given again, um, you know, we know that racial tensions don't ever really die down, but are particularly high at this moment. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of Black people, per se, don't even want to entertain the idea of seeing someone who they might even have a chance of um, having a microaggression or will there be racial harassment or something even in the therapist room. So a lot of people don't even want to take that chance. So again, I think it's completely fine for you to set those boundaries around what you're looking for that are the best fit for you. But I also want to make sure that we uh, talk about the fact that just because you go to a therapist the first time and it is not a great experience or you don't really feel like it works, it doesn't mean that therapy doesn't work at all. Yes. It could mm -hmm. just mean that that wasn't the best person for you. And I think that's often what happens is that people will have one bad experience with therapy. And of course, we never want people to have bad experiences, but it happens. We're human. Um, and so it could have just been a mismatch. You know, it could have been that right. this was not the best fit for you. So if you do have um, the patience to try again, then I think it's important to, to try to find another therapist who may be a better fit for you. I was going to, I was going to ask Charlamagne, do you feel like you're cheating on your therapist when you go leave, when you go to another therapist? And the reason I ask, like, you know, if you go, you got a barber or, or you got a hairstylist, and you got to go to someone else, it makes you feel a little awkward. Like, damn, I feel funny leaving somebody. Do you feel that no, way with your therapist? Absolutely not. And I mean, I got so many, um, you know, doctors around me now, whether it's Dr. Alfie, you know, Dr. Rita Walker, Dr. Jessica Clemens. Like, I, I'm constantly talking to them anyway. So, no. Gotcha. I don't feel like I'm cheating at all. I feel like I'm upgrading. Well, you know, a lot of people do feel that way. A lot of people, we have a lot of conversation in our community um, when people kind of feel like, okay, I don't know if this therapist is the best one, or I feel like I've gone as far as I can with this particular therapist. A lot of people have anxiety about breaking up, so to speak, with their therapist. Um, and so it is important to know that as therapists, we understand that that's a part of the process, right? Like it doesn't have to mean that I'm a bad therapist or that you're a bad client. Maybe we have just done as much as we can in our work. <laughs> together or maybe somebody else will be a better fit for you do you throw my file That's away though i could break up with you easily <laughs> if i know you're throwing my file away after i'm done here 
we do not throw the file away. Legally, <laughs> we're required to keep the file for a number Goodness of years, God. depending on your state. Dr. Joy, how important is it? I know you talk about unplugging, but let's discuss that, especially in this day and age. We have elections coming up and there's a pandemic going on around us. There's people struggling financially. How important is unplugging? Mm -hmm. I think it's critically important, Angela. You know, again, especially as when we find ourselves anxious, it is very normal for us to want to find answers, right? And one of the first places a lot of us look is social media. We want to hear what other people are saying, what's what's being shared. Um, and while some of that can be helpful, we really can go down the rabbit hole and make our anxiety even more um, increased yes, because we're too much of that digging. And so I think it's important to kind of dip into the news or to what's happening on social media maybe once or twice a day. Um, but if you notice yourself kind of losing track of time and you've been on Twitter for two hours and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that all this time was lost. Or if you find yourself getting particularly triggered by certain accounts that you follow, I think it's important that you mute or unfollow those accounts because mm -hmm. look at the, the reaction that you're having. Um, but to, to really be paying attention to the reaction that you're having when you're spending all of this time on social media. A little information is important, but there does um, exist a limit to where you really flooded yourself with information. You know, I want to ask you, Dr. Joy, how was therapy viewed in your household growing up? Like, what made you want to get into that space? Mm -hmm. There was never a conversation about therapy in my household. So I come, a, come from a very small town in Louisiana, and I struggle. I don't even know that there was a therapist in my town or, like, we probably had to go to Baton Rouge or New Orleans if we would have wanted to see a therapist. Now, of course, we had school counselors in the school, right? But at that time, the counselor primary, primarily was doing like scheduling and stuff. So I don't know that I ever thought about it as a place to go and talk if I have concerns. Um, so it really wasn't until I took a psychology class in high school um, that I became aware that this was a whole field um, that you could go into dedicated to really helping people with their struggles and concerns. Did, did your parents ever come to you and tell you about any issues that they were having? Because, I mean, that happened to me when I started being open about going to therapy and, you know, my anxiety and depression. My dad tells me he tried to kill himself 30 years ago. And my dad told me he was on 10 to 12 different medications. And he told me he was going to therapy two and three times a week. And like you, I'm from a small town in South Carolina, but they never told me. He never told me that growing up. I, I would I would visit him in rehab and think he was at a resort or something like so did your parents ever yeah. come to you and tell you about any issues they were having? You know, really interestingly enough, so my mom has six sisters. We come from a, a very large family. And so there has been a, a long history of the women in my family struggling with anxiety, but nobody ever called it that. So it was always, my nerves are bad. Right? My nerves are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so people would say that and it wasn't really until I got older that I recognized that these were actually anxiety concerns that people have been talking about. So we've definitely been able to have um, larger conversations now that I'm more aware, um, but it definitely wasn't something that I was super aware of growing up. I want to know what them nerve pills was now my grandma was taking. She always wanted to, I, I want to know what that medication was now. I don't I remember her saying I got to take my nerve medicine. I want to know what that was yeah. now. Yeah, it likely was some kind of like anti-anxiety or anti-depressive mm -hmm. kind of medication. What are some things you've been doing, Dr. Joy, personally during this time just to make sure that you uh, have are in a good space? Mm -hmm. So I have two little ones. Um, so we also have the additional stressor of like digital learning now. So y'all mm -hmm. keep your fingers crossed for me. Um, but we have been trying. <laughs> get outside as much as possible um you know so we're in atlanta so the weather has still been relatively good for us up until now um so we try to get outside at least every day and on the weekends we try to be out of the house as much as possible um i try to get as much physical exercise as i can um again though that's sometimes difficult with two little ones um and i also am really working hard to stay connected to my support system so again i know we've talked about this um and lots of people have talked about this a lot um you know making sure that you're in intentional because we don't have the same access of just kind of dropping by somebody's house anymore, or grabbing lunch, right? So you have to really go that extra step to make sure that you're staying connected to your support system. So those are some of the things I've been working on. Uh, Dr. Right. Joe, you are, you're an AKA, right? Mm-hmm. Break down the psyche of why some people don't like AKAs. Why oh, they be hating on this? Here we go again. And, and, and for all the AKAs out, AKAs out there, we're not hating on you guys. 
people call. They thought that that you were hating on them and that we were hating. We were just asking that a question. I was hating. Co- yeah, I don't know where they got that from. I was asking a question. I really do see some unnecessary hate for AKAs, and, and I just wonder, like, where does this hate? Where does it come from? What's what's the psyche of these people, Doctor Joy? I mean, well, without talking to people individually, I would necessarily know, but I think that there are different stereotypes about all of the sororities and fraternities, right? And so when we would believe and kind of buy into stereotypes, then we know that we often have information wrong. And so I think it's more important to kind of get to know individual people. Is that old gotcha. school or does that still go on now? Because I feel like that was like kind of old, you know, in the past. I, I feel like people aren't like that so much. I feel like some of those stereotypes are still very alive. I mean, I think we definitely have come a long way since maybe 15 or 20 years ago, but I think some of those stereotypes still exist. Got you. Now, real quick, what what should people look for when they go to therapy? Because we talked about people sitting down with therapists and feeling like it wasn't for them. What should they expect? What should be the expectation when you sit down with a therapist? Mm hmm. So I think the expectation is that, you know, probably within the first three sessions that you feel comfortable. Right. So even if you haven't shared the the entirety of your story, do you feel comfortable sharing at least what you've shared up until that point? Um, Do you feel like the person is listening to you? Do you really feel like they get you or do you feel like they will make a comment and then they're way off base? You know, so there should be some feeling of, okay, this person really understands what I'm coming from. You should also feel like um, the person can actually help you, you know, so not necessarily that they can wave a magic wand, but they should make you feel comforted um, and secure in that they can provide some answers or some some relief from the kinds of things that you're struggling with. Um, I also think it's really important to to feel like you can open up eventually. So again, you may not feel like you can share everything in that first session and you don't have to. Um, and I think a lot of people also get really anxious about that first session because they're like, what am I gonna say? There's so much, how am I gonna tell everything, right? And so I, I like to encourage people to kind of take that strain off of yourself. So your first couple of sessions, probably the therapist will likely be doing most of the talking. So those are what are called your intake sessions. Um, And that's when the therapist is really trying to get a lot of information from you about what's been going on, what brought you to therapy, what has worked Mm -hmm. in the past, what hasn't worked in the past. So you don't have to stress too much about what you're going to talk about. It's very likely that the therapist will lead you at least in those first couple of conversations. You know, Mm -hmm. even with therapy being normalized, there's a lot of black people who still feel like I'm not going to therapy. You got to be batshit crazy to go to therapy. Do you think we'll ever be able to eradicate that stigma completely? I think that we are doing a really good job. And of course, there's always more to go. But we know that there will always be some, like everything is not for everybody, right? No matter how much education, information, like everybody will not buy in. But I think the more that we continue to have these conversations, the more that people share um, what happened in their therapy session, the more people share the fact that they have a therapist. I think every new interaction and every new share really does chip away at the stigma that exists related to mental health. So I think we're doing a good job, but of course there's more, more room to go. Now, Dr. Joe, you you have a lot of resources that are available to people who are listening. So just so we can make sure people know where they can go so they can contact you and also see what resources are available. What is the website? Mm -hmm. So the website is therapyforblackgirls.com. And you've already heard me talk about the fact that we have a therapist directory listed there. So you can hit the tab that says find therapists. Um, We have a weekly podcast that comes out every Wednesday morning. And we also have a smaller community within Therapy for Black Girls called the Yellow Couch Collective, which is really just, again, a more intimate community for members of our larger community to interact with one another, to support one another. Um, And it's called the Yellow Couch Collective because I actually have a yellow couch in my therapy office and so the idea is what if we could all just kind of gather and hang out in my office and talk about some of the things that would really help us this is what it would feel like of course in a virtual space um so like you mentioned lots of incredible resources all dedicated to black women and girls you know you touched on it earlier how how does pop culture tie into the mental health thing and how can pop culture help to normalize you know uh Mm -hmm. seeking treatment for mental health Yeah, so I think we've seen some really good jobs and some not so good jobs of uh, mental health concerns being shared in different movies and different TV shows. And so that's a part of what's really encouraging to me is that I feel like we've seen some really good storylines like on Insecure, for example, um, when Molly met with a therapist, right? And so I think, again, when you see those kinds of storylines in some of your favorite shows or in the things that you're listening to, then that... 
what is it? Billions. You watch billions? Billions, <laughs> billions I don't know, is the best example. I mean, so she was <laughs> the Sopranos. Right? Um, the the best example for me is girlfriends. <laughs> Oh, girlfriends is the best example. Everything goes back to well, girlfriends with him. Yes, Joan oh, and Tony go to uh, 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 see a therapist on girlfriends. I'm still in the middle of my rewatch, so I haven't gotten to those sessions yet. Um, but of course, there were lots going on between Joan and Tony. And of course, now as you're older, rewatching it, right? You're like, oh, yeah, yes. they definitely could have benefited from talking to someone. But again, I think even all of those very small examples really just go to plant a seed that, oh, this is something that might be a resource for me. Um, so I think pop culture can do a really good job of, again, normalizing that conversation and just making it much more talkable. Gotcha. Well, Dr. Joy, thank you. Uh, thank I, you like I said, I love I love the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Y'all should check that out every Wednesday. It's a, it's a good starting point. I know somebody, my my my, my homegirl Sim, she actually found a therapist from Therapy for Black Girls. So, y'all are doing great All work right, out baby. here. Thank right. you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Joy Harden Bradford. Appreciate you for joining us. And it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.